little bit about the example of random interactions in lamellar systems. Uh, here you see two. Uh, oh, you have a pointer? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, two uh, examples of lamellar systems would be the lipid multilamellar system. You see the lipid bilayer here, and the yellow here is a water layer. So, you see a periodic arrangement of water layers and uh, lipid bilayers. And the other example would be a uh, complex of DNA and cationic lipid bilayers. And again, you see a nice lamellar arrangement of lipid bilayers and DNA in between solid is not shown here, but of course there's uh, a lot of water molecules in between. Um, the question is, what are the interactions in uh, such a system? Uh, Van der Waals interactions, if you remember, uh, the last uh, in the previous talk, I uh, showed you a version of the Lischitz formula for small separations, and you saw that the interaction goes as, goes as 1 over d squared, so 1 over the separation uh, between semi-infinite uh, media. But here we have a finite size um, chunks of matter interacting over a slab of thickness d, and the interaction because of that is a little bit more complicated. So you can formulate a uh, theory of interactions in a complicated arrangement of periodic layers between two left and right semi-infinite media. And you can ask yourself, what is the effective interaction between two, let's say, blue um, layers across the red layer in an assembly, in an infinite assembly of other layers? And it turns out, so I'm not going to go through all the details, so it turns out that, uh, of course, the interaction is a little bit different. If you have two lone layers interacting over a single layer of water, as opposed to the same geometry but multiply replicated. So there are pronounced non-pairwise additive effects, in other words. You cannot say that interactions across the two layers here is the same as here, because you have other layers in this uh, array that also contribute to the uh, interactions. And in fact, it turns out that you can uh, exactly sum these non-pairwise additive interactions, and you get a, an effective chemical coefficient. You remember that the chemical coefficient comes out of the Lifshitz formula, and it's the coefficient that goes with 1 over d squared dependence. Uh, we don't call it chemical constant because it turns out that this principle it also depends on the separation, so it's not always a constant. And you can see that nicely here. So one case is the, I think, blue is the interaction in this case. So two layers in the universe and red is the interaction between the same two layers but in an infin infinite array of other layers. And there's a difference, as you can see right here. The difference is due to non-pairwise additivity of van der Waals interactions. That's an important feature of van der Waals interactions that is very difficult usually to take into account. There are very few cases where you can calculate the contribution of non-pairwise additive effects explicitly. But there's a well-known uh, Axelrod-Teller formula for uh, interaction between three particles, which is not the sum of the interaction of pairs. And the other case would be here, the exact resummation of the interaction between two layers in an infinite uh, array of other layers. In order to calculate that, you need the dielectric response. You remember that the Van der Waals interaction depends on epsilon of omega, uh, meaning the dielectric dispersion of the media. In the form of epsilon of i omega, it's a functional of epsilon of omega, so this is dielectric response as a function of the imaginary frequency. And here I plot it for you, the dielectric epsilon of i omega for water and for lipids right here. So lipid and water. Of course, uh, dielectric response of lipids is uh, uh, smaller 
epsilon is smaller because it's a non-polar medium as opposed to water, which is a polar medium, and of course it approaches uh, epsilon around 80 as uh, frequency goes to zero. So we just the difference between the blue and the red leftmost. Yeah. Say it again. So this is the Hamaker coefficient for this case versus this case. So in this case, we just have two layers. Triple layer. Okay. Uh, yeah. And this this is an infinite system of layers. And that there is a difference because the random loss interaction has a non-pairwise additive problem. And you see it's not small. Yeah. It can be there. Compare two bilayers in an array and solo. So solo would be this case, and array would be that case. This is just an example of uh, things that we can do. Yes. What is yellow LLR stuff? Where? Yellow stuff, LR. On the LR, it can be actually blue. You can just take it as water. In, in the calculation, I formulated it as a general boundary layer. So you can take it as water. So um, now uh, we will leave the um, Van der Waals interactions behind. This is the first example of molecular attractions. I will be mostly dealing with the attractive interactions. And we will go to the case of electrostatic correlation interactions, which is um, the interaction between charge surfaces with uh, counter charge, meaning mobile counter ions or salt ions. Um, as a function of the separation. There are people in the audience who at least uh, for some time have been working on this problem. I think Elshad has some experience in that, right? Uh, Elshad was doing uh, sophisticated uh, simulations of this kind of systems, in particular DNA. I will not go into, the, into any concrete example of these interactions. I'm sure Elshad told you uh, his story. Uh, I will just try to introduce some new concepts, maybe old concepts also, to deal with uh, electrostatic interaction in salt. So, um, electrostatic interactions uh, in the world, uh, world of colloids go way back, but the first quantitative formulation of, this, uh, of these interactions comes from the beginning of the 20th century. So, Bui and Chapman. Uh, later, the and Huckel, and finally, Hervé and Overbeck, who also wrote the book on the subject. So we could say that 1948, when this book was published, it's one of the uh, science classics, uh, still worth reading, uh, would be an Anus Mirabilis for colloid science, uh, because they um, set up a framework to talk about the electrostatic interaction in not only in colloidal, science, but also in soft ladder physics in general. And uh, the um, theory proposed by Ferbe and Overbeck and also by Theriabin and Landau a little bit before that time, uh, but uh, less known because it was published in a Russian journal, uh, is based on a interaction potential between planar surfaces, planar dielectric surfaces, that can be decomposed into a sum of a repulsive and attractive contribution. The attractive co contribution is already known than the Waals interaction that I discussed before. And the repulsive inter contribution is the electrostatic part of the interaction based on the Poisson-Boltzmann theory or the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, which is written right here. I will go over the details of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Poisson-Boltzmann equation has nothing to do with the Poisson or Boltzmann, but it contains equations. So, so one part of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation is the Poisson equation, and the uh, other part is the Boltzmann distribution. So that's why it's referred to as the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. And here you see a few curves of this sum. Uh, you see that we can have a minimum, secondary mini minimum right here, and the primary minimum of Van der Waals interactions at very small separations. This uh, primary minimum is uh, artificial. The Van der Waals interactions uh, never show this divergence. And in fact, they are counteracted by other strong forces uh, acting between surfaces in aqueous media, like hydration interaction, which is much stronger than anything that uh, uh, Van der Waals interaction could counteract. Uh, that's why this minimum here is uh, an artifact of the 
of many simplifications that go into this theory. So uh, anyhow, what is the nature of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, the standard description of uh, electrostatic interaction? Imagine two charged surfaces with mobile counter ions. So mobile counter ions right here. This is maybe negatively charged, and these are positively charged counter ions. Um, if we look at the electrostatic energy, the minimum of the electrostatic energy would, would correspond to pure absorption of the counter charge onto the surface. And the entropic part would correspond, of course, to a uniform distribution of counter charge between the surfaces. Uh, as we have to deal with the uh, free energy, not energy itself, but free energy, this is a system defined at a constant temperature, we have to actually look at the difference between energy and entropy. And if we minimize the free energy, we get a non-homogeneous distribution of counter charge. So it's somewhere in between the energy and entropy. You have a profile of the counter charge between the two charged surfaces. Formally, the way we do that is that we sum the electrostatic free energy part, which is right here. You recognize epsilon, epsilon zero, grad phi squared electrostatic energy. Rho, this is uh, uh, density of the counter charge times phi. This is the coupling between the electrostatic potential and the density of the mobile charges. These are the external charges. Sigma is the surface charge density. So until here, this is just the electrostatic energy. And this part is nothing but the ideal gas entropy. And the Poisson-Boltzmann equation that follows from minimization of this free energy thus corresponds to a minimum, um, to a thermodynamic equilibrium set by the <coughs> ideal entropy and uh, electrostatic interaction energy. So if you minimize this, you will get this equation for a single ionic species. And you can see why this is called the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. This is the Poisson equation on this side. Uh, and this is the Boltzmann distribution on the right-hand side. To the equation, we have to add boundary conditions that follow from electroneutrality of the system. So the total charge has to be zero. This is usually the case, because if it wouldn't be zero, the system would just explode. It would not be stable. So uh, electroneutrality has to be guaranteed. There was a development in the late 70s and 80s uh, regarding simulation of uh, this kind of systems. So people started simulating uh, electrostatic uh, charge systems. Tori and Valo were the first to do that in the early 80s. Computer capabilities at that time were, were, were quite uh, meager, so to say. Uh, and uh, I have a little story about that in, in my home university in Ljubljana. Uh, certain Dushan Bratko started doing these simulations in the early 80s. And uh, he got permission to use the computer of the central bank to do that, because the, uh, this was the larger computer, largest computer at that time. And he was using it uh, during the night and over the weekends. And uh, after doing his simulations for a while, he stopped because he kept getting attractive interactions between equally charged surfaces. And he couldn't figure out why this is so. So at the end, he started thinking that this is probably some kind of uh, error in the code. It cannot be real, because we know that equal charges, of course, repel. So uh, he left for a postdoc in Sweden with, with uh, Jönsson. And he told him that um, he was doing all these simulations. But unfortunately, there's obviously an error in the code. And uh, maybe he should take a look at it. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe nothing. So these four guys were working on this code for a long time and eventually figured out that, no, this is a real effect uh, of, of the electrostatic interaction. Other people got the same results. And the result is that the forces between equally charged bodies can, be, can become attractive. This is, uh, contradicts the standard Poisson-Boltzmann result or the DLBO result, where the electrostatic interaction always adds an attractive contribution to the total interaction for a symmetric system, of course. If the system is asymmetric, Adrian has worked out formulas that show that, of course, you can have attractive interactions in that case, but that's a non-symmetric case. 
for a symmetric case, for some Watson theory, mean field theory always gives you repulsions. So you can see on these graphs how the uh, interaction pressure as a function of the surface charge density at a particular spacing goes from positive values being uh, corresponding to repulsion through zero to negative values. This was uh, a very perplexing result in the mid 80s, so 84. Uh, that uh, led to this whole um, industry of uh, uh, modern electrostatic theory where interactions need not be repulsive anymore, equally charged bodies. This is my own view, uh, my, my own um, sort of view, yes, on the history of the subject. So uh, there's the simulation paper, there are previous indications. Uh, if you read Osama's book on polyelectrolytes, you will see that he did some calculations on the uh, uh, interaction between charged cylinders, and he already has some kind of attractions there. One can argue that the calculations are simple, it's too simplistic, that this, that, and so on, but nevertheless, he was the first one to propose these interactions in uh, cylindrical systems. Um, Adrian and Ninam did uh, similar calculations based on the theory of Van der Waals interactions. It turns out that there's a nice correspondence between Van der Waals interactions and this kind of correlation attractions in chart systems. Then there's uh, Ronald Schiander and uh, Stefan Marchilia who did a very sophisticated integral equation theory based on the liquid state theory. Other people who work on this, uh, Vic Bloomfield, the mid 90s, specifically for the case of DNA, and all these different approaches sort of converge to the work of Nets and Moreira that uh, formulated a theory of uh, electrostatic correlation uh, interaction. Uh, I list here also Cornish and Lakin, that is many times referred in the context of interactions between DNA but that's based on a little bit different assumption of specific ion absorption to uh, sites on the DNA. Uh, other approaches are non-specific. They don't have any specific uh, interaction between ions and charged surfaces. So uh, after, in, in the late 90s, the subject was rediscovered in the context of interactions between DNA uh, Bill Galbart, uh, Robin Brunsma, and uh, people around them in the in '97 published a paper of uh, their simulations on <coughs> the, uh, interactions between DNA molecules specifically. So uh, they have they have two cylinders with the charge density corresponding to DNA and so on. And what they show here is the force between the cylinders as a function of the distance between the cylinder for monovalent divalent, trivalent ions, and you see that as the density, uh, as the valency of the counter ions increases, there is a pronounced attractive component that is established. These are all one parameter theories, so they cannot explain ionic specificity that you can see in experiments. So in experiments, not all ions of the same valency act the same. Some monovalent ions act differently than other monovalent ions. All divalent ions are not the same. Trivalent ions are not the same. But of course, on this level, where the only property of the ion is a charge, you cannot capture these effects. You have to go to another property. There has to be some other property of the ion that you need to take into account to get a variation between equally charged counterparts. Yes? So is this mean for a composition of uh, uh, what? Uh, just, uh, is this just electrostatics? Or? This is electrostatics, but, but it's not electrostatics from Poisson Boltzmann equation. Why is there a minimum? Why is there what? Why is the minimum? The minimum? So obviously, obviously you have an attractive component to the interaction. Yeah? This is what I said that, uh, in the simulation. It so can not become a attractive. It's not a competition between an attractor and a repulsive force. It is obviously a competition between attraction and repulsion, mm -hmm. repulsion but the attraction is not very well. This is without any. Missing by the cool effect. So the, the electrostatic force changes sign. Yes. 
for very highly charged counterance. So for very highly charged counterance, this was known for a long time. For some Boltzmann equation just breaks down. And, I mean, you can pretend that it's still something you can use. Of course, you can use it, you can calculate things, but they're not quantitative. For monovalent counterions, with purely electrostatic interactions, for some Boltzmann solutions are OK, but not for more complicated cases. So there's, there's been also other simulations, and I'm sure uh, Elsha is quite familiar with that. So you have an array of DNA molecules, and you measure, or, or you simulate the osmotic pressure in an array, and this is what you see. So it's very similar uh, in terms of this electrostatic interaction. I think what's fair, just to give the intuition, that when you have a polyvalent ion, you create asymmetries in the charges, and that's why you can get an attraction. I think that's what it's worrying about. Hmm. Yeah. So um, in uh, the year 2000, it became clear that, in fact, uh, it's not completely crazy to expect attractive interactions with uh, highly charged, within highly charged systems. And it turns out that if you combine the Coulomb's law right here with the KT of energy, and let's assume we have planar charge surfaces, you can um, define two length scales, which are well known, but they knew. Uh, for this particular case, one is the Bjorn length right here. So the Bjorn length specifically is the length between two charges at which the, is the separation between two charges at which the interaction energy, Coulomb interaction energy, equals kT. That's the definition of the R. For aqueous solutions, it's 7.4 ohms, about 7. And the other important length is the Gu Chapman length, an old uh, length scale introduced by Gu and Chapman. And it's defined very in a very similar way. So this would be the separation between a point ion and a uniformly charged surface at which the interaction, electrostatic interaction energy is kT. So it's always coupled with kT. And if I have two length scales, of course, if I divide them, I get something that doesn't have any units. And we call this the coupling parameter. And if I evaluate it just by the division, I see that it goes at surface charge density, we are on length squared, and the third power of the valence of the ions. So the coupling parameter depends a lot <coughs> on what kind of counter ions you have. So when for a general value of this coupling parameter, it's very difficult to compute electrostatic interactions. There's no valid limiting case that you could treat. Uh, it's a simple theory, simple equation. But there are two limits which lead to an explicit way to calculate the partition function. One is the so-called weak coupling limit, which we already know. This corresponds to the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. You can easily show that if psi is small, so this, you should take this as a formal limit, of course. Yeah. It's like the, the bicycle limiting law in the limit of very small concentration. So in this case, Poisson-Boltzmann equation becomes exact. And you can, of course, solve it. And for a symmetric system, you get repulsive interactions between the charges. And the other limit would be the so-called strong coupling limit, which depends, which, which corresponds to a very large coupling constant, meaning a very large uh, effective valency of the counter. Imagine you have some kind of a micellar solution or a solution of uh, nanoparticles, highly charged gold spheres, and so on. For that case, this approach would be appropriate. Uh, the way you differentiate between these two approaches is for the Poisson-Boltzmann case, of course, because psi goes to zero, you need to have many, many counter ions to neutralize the charges on the surface. And that allows you to use a continuum language. You can talk about the density profile, about the average potential, and so on. You can do that because there are many counter ions that have to be there to neutralize the system. On the other hand, assume that Z is very, very large. In principle, uh, this is formal limit. You need only one counter ion to neutralize the surfaces. That's the other limit. So this is exactly opposite to the collective description. This is a single particle description. So in uh, calculating the partition function of a charged system, you can do two separate 
limiting cases, which are easily computable. You can actually calculate them both, leading to limiting results. In general, unfortunately, this is not possible. So in general, the best you can do is some kind of simulation, which is bounded by the two uh, limits of the weak coupling, poisson Bolson and the strong coupling. What, uh, the way to do that, I'm not going to go into formal details, but, but there's a paper by Edwards and Leonard uh, in the actually early 60s that sort of paved the way, but was forgotten. Uh, nobody looked at it. And uh, um, it contains a proper reformulation of the uh, Coulomb gas statistical sum of the prediction function in terms of what we can say is a field theory that leads to a kind of a Schrodinger equation. This is very formal, so I'm not going to go into that. That allows you to derive this to limit. This is what I did many years ago, actually deriving the poisson boltzmann equation from this kind of approach and showing that the second order fluctuations around the poisson boltzmann equation correspond to uh, Lifshitz van der Waals term of zero frequency. <clears throat> this is what now in the van der Waals interaction uh, theory. Uh, Adrian has been working on that too. Uh, uh, you take not the Maxwell equations this for, for a description of the electromagnetic field, but you take the uh, linearized poisson boltzmann or the uh, the Van Hoeven equation to describe the electrostatic field. And if you calculate the appropriate Hamaker coefficient or the Van der Waals interaction, you get the same thing as if you do second order fluctuations in this field theory fashion. So these two approaches are the same. But this is very formal. I don't know how to do this. Uh, if I look at the distribution of counter ions close to a charged surface, for small values of the coupling parameter as opposed to the large values of the coupling parameter. Here's the difference. This is the most intuitive uh, representation of what's happening here. So with the small charges, of course, you have a distribution of counter ion that has a length, a size, which is the bull chapman length, of course. And the density is, starts with the large value and then decays into the bulk. Whereas for very highly charged surface, most of the counter ions are right, right next to the surface because the electrostatic interaction is just very, very big. Uh, this in itself would not be that important if we wouldn't have the corresponding, uh, the corresponding uh, effect of this distribution in the interactions between two such surfaces. There has been, unfortunately, some confusion in the field. In 98, there was a paper published in Nature, of all places, claiming that even for symmetrically charged surfaces, on a Poisson-Boltzmann level, just by solving the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, you can get attractions. It was heavily numeric. I'm not sure these people actually checked their code, whether it makes sense or not. But it made a big splash. There was actually a commentary in Nature saying, this is great. Finally, we see that Poisson Boltzmann gives you attractions even for symmetric boundary conditions. But it turned out very soon that, in fact, this is all wrong. So Derek Chan, among other people, uh, came up with an exact mathematical proof that Poisson Boltzmann equation, in any geometry with symmetric boundary conditions, ha has to give repulsions. There's no way around it. If your code for solving the Poisson Boltzmann equation in that particular geometry gives you attractions that do something wrong. So anyhow, this, this, this not, did not contribute to the understanding of interactions, but it was highly publicized and published in nature, as I said. So the, the important thing about um, strong coupling theory is that it gives rise to attractive interactions, as you can see here. So this is the poisson boltzmann theory, always above zero in pressure, meaning interactions always repulsive, and the strong coupling theory, which can give you attractions. And the lines here, the symbols, correspond to the coupling parameter somewhere, somewhere between zero and infinity, so some finite number. You see that you can start, let's say, with a strong coupling, and then you approach the weak coupling for larger separations. And as I said, strong coupling theory is a one-body theory, so you just have a single neutralizing uh, counter ion, but highly, highly charged, highly charged. 
so on. Uh, if, I, if I go into more specific details, let's take two equally charged surfaces, there's counter ions in between, separation is delta, and what I will do is I will calculate, I will solve the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, and then calculate the fluctuations in the electrostatic potential around the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. And I get two parts in the osmotic pressure. One is, of course, the Poisson-Boltzmann, and the other one is the fluctuation. And the Poisson-Boltzmann, this is standard theory, you have to solve this boundary condition equation, and the solution insert back into the this equation that depends on lambda. Lambda is uh, a dimension of surface charge. And the uh, fluctuational part, so the quadratic fluctuations around Poisson Boltzmann, give you this. This is just zero frequency van der Waals interaction. And this is the sum of the two. Right? You see that if the correlations are small, you have repulsion. And if the correlations are larger, there's a, eventually a regime where the, intera the attractive interactions would be dominated. But uh, when I started doing this, uh, I got a question from the audience, and this was actually Rob, Robin Brunsma who asked me that for the first time. If, you know, here you assume that this is a small perturbation on Poisson Boltzmann, that's why you can do quadratic fluctuations. Yeah? If, if the fluctuations are small, you can go to quadratic order and stop there. But then in the pressure, you see that they can become dominant. How do you know that there's not other higher order terms that, uh, uh, become more important than the second order term. And at that time, I, I wasn't able to reply because uh, everybody was doing quadratic perturbation theory. And that turned out to be the start of the strong coupling theory, to go beyond this quadratic order to see what's happening to higher orders. And if you do it appropriately, uh, you get to the strong coupling theory right here. So you, we have nine highly charged counter ions between surfaces. And actually, the uh, expression for the osmotic pressure or the interaction pressure becomes quite simple, very, very simple. And the simulations are always between the two. So uh, even if you cannot evaluate the uh, interaction pressure exactly for any value of the um, surface charge density, I'd still, I think it's still very important to have two limiting cases. For, so anything that can happen electrostatically has to be between these two limits. It's like the bicycle limit, you know, it rarely works, but at least it's a limiting law that sets the scale for what you calculate with more specific, with more sophisticated theory, theories of, or what you can see in an experiment. And that's the same thing. Typically those twiddles on the D, those are just uh, the by length scale. Yeah, this is everything is scaled in the no, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So give us an intuition for the typical salts that you're talking about. So here I'm not of length. Yeah, here I'm not talking about any salt. So specifically for this particular case, D is scaled with respect to the um, which atom. D is D divided by the which atom. There's no salt. So if you can do that. Which atom length as it would have been for an isolated surface. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the scale. So um, this kind of a theory has many idealizations, many, many idealizations. So its range of validity is, um, I mean, we have to keep in mind that uh, its range of validity does not extend to any possible combination of charges or separations and so on. But there's a particular defect in the theory that I would like to address as the second part of this talk. Um, uh, as, as you noticed, I didn't speak about experiments at all. People have measured these interactions. They, they show all sorts of features that are not captured by this kind of theory. And most prominently, iron-specific effects are, of course, not captured, because this is a one-parameter theory. Right? None of the theories that are out there is more than one parameter theory, so we simply cannot deal with that. You have to go to higher, you know, other parameters describing uh, uh, either the charge of the ion or the hydration state of the ion or the polarizability of the ion, but something has to be there in addition to the charge. Otherwise, of course, you will always produce the same kind of interaction for the same charge of the ions. 
be they sodium, lithium, or whatever. It's always going to be the same. So this is, does not take into account time-specific information. On the other hand, it also does not take into account more complicated distribution of the charge. Uh, I was talking about equal, uh, so uniformly charged surfaces. This is a huge, huge uh, assumption and uh, idealization which is, that is actually never true in nature. Surfaces are very complicated, and the charge on the surfaces is distributed, like we can see here. So this is a, a surface to which we absorb hemi micelles, positively charged hemi micelles, and one would think that they absorb into a uniform surface layer, giving it a uniform charge. But if you look at the actual state of absorption, you see all these stripes that actually correspond to hemi micelles running along the surface. Uh, right here, you can see it even clearly. So the, obviously, the charge distribution of the surface is very, very complicated. And it's not even close to a unicorn. This is also something that's completely missed from all these theories. Even more uh, uh, drastic example is uh, dibrock copolymer surfaces. So you see here the nature of the surface. I'm not sure what this is. So this is interconnected islands of cobalt formed on polystyrene, blah, blah, blah. So this is a surface that has domains of one type of ion and a matrix of the polymer in between. See, it's a complicated texture. And the, the size of these domains is, of course, comparable to the separation between the, sur to the surfaces when you do the experiment. And there's no way you can assume that calculations or even conceptual thinking about the interaction would follow from a uniformly charged surfaces. You cannot. You have to, you have to do more. Right? You have to take this into account. And this is the last experiment uh, that I'm aware of. So there's a, a more recent uh, reference by Susan Perkin and uh, uh, Jacob Klein. What they were doing is that they were studying the interaction between two surfaces with domains on the surface. Yeah, you can see the domains here. And actually, the domains, because they correspond to absorption of uh, amplifiers, and later you bake the amplifiers into the surface so they cannot move anymore. Yeah? So this corresponds to this situation. I'm sure the picture explains uh, better than if I would explain it in work. And as they approach the surfaces, they find this strange attractive interaction that sets in at a certain separation. And uh, when I talked to them years ago, I, I asked Jacob, you know, are you sure that as, as you push the surfaces together, the, this profile, the profile of the charge on the surface does not change? And at that time, they were not sure about that. So now they do the experiment where they move the surfaces together, and then they shake them like that. So that if the pattern on the surface would want to change, it has time to change. Does it? And then, yes, does it change? Uh, no, it does not. So the conclusion of their experiment is that this disordered distribution is baked in, baked in to the surface. So when you create the surface, you create also this disordered pattern, but then as you push the surfaces together, it does not change it. Huh? This is the claim. This is their experiment. Okay. And uh, this uh, attractive interaction, which is larger than Van der Waals, if you calculate Van der Waals, it be somewhere here, so you see that it's larger than Van der Waals, uh, maybe is connected with this disordered distribution of charges. And this is what I wanted to investigate. What to expect? So if you have the disordered charge distribution, what are we supposed to expect? What kind of interactions would we see if this would be the only event? And so we took a charge surface with what you see here is uh, just to present symbolically this order on the charge surface. This order has its own Gaussian distribution, so this is not a constant anymore, but has a variation on the surface. And then you ask yourself, what will the interaction be if the charge is distributed with this kind of disorder distribution? And technically, this corresponds to quench disorder. Quenched meaning that once the disorder is established, it doesn't change it. You can also have a neo disorder, which is, uh, happens 
in the case of lipids, let's say if you have a uh, two component lipid bilayer and you have uh, charged and uncharged lipids, as you push the two layers together, the lipids will of course, re will of course rearrange. Okay. As you push them together, different configurations of the lipid distribution will come into play. But not here. The assumption here is different. The assumption is that the disorder is baked in, it does not react to the change in the separation between surfaces. There's a technical complication, of course, how you evaluate the position function and so on, but I'm not going to go into that. So it turns out that if you have a disordered distribution of charge on the surface, there are actually two coupling parameters that you can define. One is the one that I already mentioned to you, the electrostatic coupling parameter. But there's another coupling parameter, which we call the disorder coupling parameter, that takes into account the disorder distribution of the charges on the surface. So depending on the strength of this disorder and on the strength of electrostatic interaction, you can have different cases. Strong disorder, stronger electrostatics, strong disorder, weak electrostatic, weak disorder, weak, and so on. So um, I'm not going to go through that. I just want to say that on the Poisson-Boltzmann level, actually, it turns out that nothing would happen on the weak coupling level. So Poisson-Boltzmann equation remains the same, even with this order, which is a strange result. But this is only valid if you don't have dielectric discontinuity. So if you, know, you have just two lone charged players in an aqueous solution, then this order doesn't matter. But if you have dielectric jump, at the surfaces, so from 80 to let's say 2, then the disorder becomes important. Let me just show you two limiting cases for small separation and for large separation. What would the disorder do? So for small separation, the first term is just what you get from Poisson-Boltzmann equation, linearized Poisson-Boltzmann equation, A is the separation, kappa is the divide, uh, inverse divide. So this is obviously it's solved. This is the standard term, and we see that there's another term that has the magnitude that is proportional to the strength of the disorder at the surface. Huh? And if you multiply the two, you will see that sigma goes away. Sigma is the surface charge density. So even if the surfaces are net uncharged, but they are disordered, so you have plus, minus, minus, plus, 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 minus, minus, and so on, summed to zero, it sums to zero. On a mean field level, on the Poisson-Boltzmann level, you would, you would think, well, the electron neutron soft interaction has to be zero. It's not zero. It, it, it has a finite value, and it depends on it. So if the charge distribution is disordered, and you have dielectric discontinuities, there is a residual interaction that is due to the presence of disorder. Now, for large separations, um, this part here is the, just the Van der Waals term the zero frequency van der Waals, but there are other terms, again, which correspond to this order. I don't want to go too much into details, but I just want to tell you that this order can be important. It can, can't be either repulsive or attractive? Uh, the repul uh, the, uh, this order here is repulsive, and here it depends on what the dielectric jump is. So it can be both in this case. It's a it's a complicated calculation because we need to take into account that part of the surfaces are positively charged, negatively charged, positive, negative, negative, positive, positive and, and there's a distribution. So summing all these terms is complicated. So that's why it's not intuitive to, to see it. The intuitive way that I got it was if I have people in opposite surfaces, just from learning, the range is different, the decay is half of the K length mm -hmm. when I have like. Yeah. So that if I have a mix, yeah. the attractive parts have a longer range. You could say that, but it's very complicated to do this average. No, oh, no, absolutely yes. But at least you can see that where the asymmetries mm -hmm. occur gets the advantage. Total. Of this is inherently an asymmetric system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that is in there some point. It's in there, <laughs> yeah. It's not, I cannot say yeah. this is it, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's in there. Yeah. Is it the same idea like when there's a negatively charged surface, for example, and contrines on the surface also, and they're like on different uh, spots on different sides? Well, counterines, you know, can move everywhere, but the, the charge distribution here is baked into the surface, so this cannot 
be peeled off into the bottom. This is something that's connected with the way you prepare the surfaces, preparation method. Yeah? No, what I'm saying is like, so there's an attractive electrostatic interaction that can be in two negative charges. Can be, I'm not saying that it's always there. Can be. Depending on and it's the, because of the distribution of the positive counter ions on the No, surface. no, no. Counter ions are different. Counter ions are mobile in the space between the surfaces. Not all of them, right? All of them are mobile. All of them are yeah. mobile. So this is, counter ion is a different type of charge than this surface charge. Surface charge, imagine, would be like some surface dissociable group or something like that. It cannot go away from the surface. It has to stay on the surface. Counter ion, on the other hand, can move around. How about big ions? Can move around. Cobalt is an Can move around. It's not baked into the surface. It might have strong affinity, but yeah. in principle, it can go away. If you put that in by hand, that it absorbs specifically to the surface and sticks there, that's a different matter. But in general, um, you cannot say that the counter ions are baked into the surface. Why do we call them condensing ions? It's a distribution. Yeah, it's always a distribution. There's a lot of misconception about the condensation, like an absorption process and sticking to the surface. This is not the case. So anyhow, uh, on the strong coupling level, there's also an interesting effect. So if you just look at this graph, this would be without the this. So this is without the disorder. Yeah? This is the same as the. Um, this is free energy, but I'll show you, I showed you the pressure before. You see there's a minimum. The pressure went through zero, so there's a minimum in the free energy. You can, here is the practice, here is the repulsive. And then when you start adding disorder, you see that you can go from this curve with a minimum to something that's like that. So it's minimum only at contact. So you can qualitatively change the behavior of the interactions in a disordered system. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to measure this interaction because, in general, you can never be sure that you have quench disorder. So that as you push the surfaces together, nothing's going to move on the surfaces. That's very, very tough to prove. So maybe a better thing would be um, to look at the uh, so-called partially annealed surfaces and the macro to details yeah, this becomes quite complicated. So you say that as you push the surfaces together, the compound, the charges on the surface can respond a little bit to the change in separation, but not completely, not like free charge, but a little bit. This is equivalent to saying that there's a different temperature on the surface than in the body, in inverted commas. This is still equilibrium, of course. But you should take into account that to some extent, depending on the energies, the surface configuration can be modified <coughs> as you push the surfaces together. And that leads to other interesting feature, features in the, in the interaction. But to sum up, the, if we just talk about electrostatics, just electrostatics, nothing else, even this is a very complicated and fascinating world. So the Coulomb law would say that opposites attract and likes repel. Always. Yeah. That's what's meant by this sort of standard wisdom. This is the Coulomb law. Opposites attract, likes repel. Now, on the weak coupling law, opposites attract and equals repel, but not quite so much, because they're screening in general. On the strong coupling law, Opposites repel and equals attract, but only if everybody is very charged. So it's just the opposite. So opposites attract, here it's opposites repel and equals attract. But only if everybody is very charged. So you have to have a lot of charge in the system for this to be true. With disorder, we see that neutrals can also attract. Yeah, so it's not, you don't really need a net charge to have interaction. You can also have net neutral body, but that interact electrostatically. And then in partial linear disorder, you can eventually say that same as in the quenched case, only more so. And on this note, I'd like to stop. So this was a little uh, introduction to the, to the world of uh, Coulomb interactions. And in my last talk, I will uh, take on a, uh, an additional variation
in the subject where the counter ions or the salt ions are flexible. They are like polymers corresponding to polyelectrolytes. And of course, that leads to very sophisticated and complicated interactions too. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.